Thank you. Welcome to the Scottsdale Big Book Study, where we will study, um, actually, we will actually have two speakers today. Um, today's date is um, Saturday, October 21st, 2023. And my name is Tanya, and I'm a grateful compulsive overeater, and I will be your host today. We also have co-host of Audrey in Ireland. Um, Sue L. will do Q&A, and, um, and Johan all the way in Sweden um, is helping us. If you have any questions during the meeting, please contact either myself or any of the co-hosts by private message in the chat function. The chat function will we will um, disable until five minutes before the questions and answers session. Please, please note that the speakers will be recorded for the duration of the study. However, the um, Q&A sessions, which follows, will not be recorded. We ask that if you please make sure to keep your microphone on mute at all times during the speakers. And please turn off your video if you're exercising, eating, or if you need to step away from your screen for any reason. During the meeting, we will post the link to our seventh tradition. This money goes towards the cost of our Zoom account, the cost of uploading our recordings, and we will also send contributions to our intergroup and WSO. We will post a link to the previous week's recording. These are available for clicking on the link that will be posted in the chat box. Okay, and I will now turn over the meeting to um, our fabulous first speaker, Annabelle Z. I got the pleasure of meeting her in person, and we had, I believe it was either lunch or dinner together at the OA birthday party, and so I know she has great experience, strength, and hope to share with us. Go right ahead, Annabelle. Well, thanks, Tanya. Um, yeah, meeting people in person at the birthday party. So good. Um, my name is Annabelle and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater and um, super, super grateful compulsive overeater. Um, and I'm also recovered from uh, restricting and yo-yo dieting and compulsive exercising and bulimia. And God, I have a mess with this, with food and um, self-image and, and uh, I no longer can control it. Um, I'll just say a little bit about myself. You know, I don't have pictures because um, my top weight was only about 35 pounds more than I am now. Ooh, that's not true. I was heavier when I was pregnant once, but that, that came off really, really fast. Why? Because I was obsessed with losing the weight I gained in my pregnancy. Um, so I was a compulsive dieter and restrictor more than anything, but, um, but my food obsession really started early on in life. Um, I will say that uh, I found alcohol when I was, well, my first drink at nine, nine years old. And I started drinking pretty um, alcoholically and started binge drinking at age uh, about 13. And by 16, I was drinking a lot. By 19, I found that I was an alcoholic and um, I really couldn't leave it alone. And it's really all I thought about. It was not about relationships you people were just there to get me to my alcohol and um you know food was kind of only it wasn't out of the picture i still was had a lot of body image issues and so um in fact i was so far from reality that j term of my one of the years in college i um i just didn't eat anything assuming I was getting all my alcohol, my calories from alcohol. And just somehow I thought, you know, I was a, I was getting a bachelor of science. So you'd think I was intelligent, but my, my intelligent brain was gone. Um, and I could not read. I, I really did suffer from a lot of um, wet brain and detoxed, went to rehab. And as soon as um, I haven't had a drink since I was 20 years old and I, um, you know, as soon as I got to rehab, it like food immediately became, um, I mean, I found large tubs of binge foods and um, ate them a lot. When I was, uh, you know, I got out of uh, rehab for alcohol and um, jumped right into the 12 step program. I lived in a halfway house and um, I went to a ton of meetings, like three meetings a day, but I never got a sponsor. And it took a year of being really jittery. And I mean, I lived 
very self-involved. I, I really didn't understand these steps. Although in rehab, I had been asked to go down to find a higher power. We did the first three steps. You know, I like, yeah, I'm, I'm powerless over, you know, alcohol at the time. And, um, and I, and I, you know, sure, I'll go and find a higher power, whatever. But I did sit in this room. They asked me to sit in and I just, I did feel a presence and um, there was a calling, a, a kind of a call saying, come, go outside and, and look at the sun. And so for a long time, I did, I went outside and I felt like a presence of love. And for a long time, the sun was my higher power. Well, let's skip forward, uh, just not a couple of years even. And I was shades pulled, packages of food, cookies, whatever you name it, all over the floor. And if my friend came over because I called her and I said, I need help. And she came over, I knew she was in OA and she took me to my first OA meeting. Incidentally, Harlan G was there. And um, I, I remember him well, I thought because of his accent, he's from New York, but he's not on today. So he's like, no, I'm from Chicago. Anyway, um, that East Coast accent. But I, um, I saw people and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I just need to work a harder fourth step. I, get, I, just, I just need to work a harder AA program. Fast forward another couple of years, I'm in grad school and now I'm obsessively exercising. I'm underweight. I, I didn't menstruate for five months and I, I had to go see a doctor because I was absolutely that shit crazy. Um, I was paranoid. I had no friends. I couldn't socialize. I just, I just need to do another four step. I, just, I mean, I was nuts. I really, really was crazy. And I could not differentiate the truth from the false for real in the sense that I, I did not know if people liked me or didn't like me. I didn't know who I was. It was awful, but I wouldn't drink. No, no. And I wouldn't commit suicide. No, no. But I thought about it. Um, I went to an OA meeting and I went to a meeting for young people with anorexia. And I thought, oh, these, honestly, I'm just going to be really frank. I was like, these losers, they can't get it together. <laughs> Total denial. <laughs> and so I'm like, I just need to work a better AA program. So let's go on for another 20 years like that. And yeah, I got my degree. I got married. I got, had children and, um, I was the most controlling person, but if you told me I was, I would just say that's just because you don't have it together, but I just, I, I just didn't know any different. And my husband always told me I was controlling. I, I couldn't get along with my kids. And, um, you know, I thought I'd arrived. And if you just all did what I wanted you to do, everything would be just fine. And at work, people did what I wanted them to do. And it was fine until it wasn't. And I started being called into the, my manager's office. And I started being told that, you know, you just need to be like nicer. And I would just come back with, well, people just need to be better workers. Um, I just was in such denial that there was anything wrong with me. And meanwhile, I'm sponsoring an AA and I'm telling people how to do it. And I'm telling people how to do their, their four step and walking them through the steps. And um, then I was told by a sponsee that I, um, I, she, she dropped me as a sponsor and she said, you know, frankly, you're just, you're not very nice. You're kind of mean. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, something might actually be wrong with me. And then I was told in, um, uh, I went back to, well, I didn't go back to, cause I had no faith as a childhood, but I joined my husband's faith and um, actually did join this church. And I really found my, my higher power there. And um, this was like 11 years into AA program. Right. And I remember being told in a leader group that, you know, you, you're really, you should stop interrupting people. And anyway, and I, I, I was like offended, but I really knew something was wrong with me at that point. And I'm now in my, my early forties. So this was still like 20 years ago. And I thought, okay, I just really, something's wrong, but I'll just work a better program. And it just got worse from there. And pretty soon I'm eating more than I can exercise off. And I'll just fast forward to being uh, 50 years old. And it was um, three, three years ago, uh, well, in the spring, um, I went on a chat room in OA. I finally said, I, I need, I need, I think I have a problem. And I was binging. I couldn't stop binging and I would stop, but I just couldn't stay stopped like more than a couple of days. And I went to the chat and it really did work. And I was like, wow, this is great. But that's COVID's happened and 
I don't know, somehow I just uh, didn't go anymore. My last, my last thing I did was the last pay and weigh I did. So I paid to paid a lot to uh, lose weight. And what I did was I, it was a birthday present to my husband. And I said, honey, I'm going to do it with you. And I thought that was just such a kind thing. And so um, we went to this program together and we both lost weight. He lost some, I lost my goal. And within three weeks, I gained 30% of it back. And I was like, something's really, really wrong here. I, I definitely am a compulsive and food addict and compulsive overeater. So I came into OA for reals um, on Zoom and um, I've been here ever since. And I, I dove right in. I, I came to uh, a lot of good meetings and I found a sponsor on a Friday meeting. And she's awesome. I know she's here today. She was, she was just fantastic. And she walked me through the steps um, the way Lori C does through the Lori C work, workbook, which focuses on the big book. And I thought that was absolutely amazing. I'd never heard of that in OA. I've never, you know, in the other meetings I'd gone to, they had literature back in the 90s that I, I don't know, I've never really read. I've read some of it, but the 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 Lori C workbook and the meetings that my sponsor guided me to were based in the big book, which is the program of recovery. And I, but I looked at it through a different lens of my compulsive overeating. And I'm like, my food addiction is way more powerful than my alcohol addiction ever had over me. And that's not because I didn't, you know, drink a lot and I wasn't powerless over alcohol. It was just that, you know, I put it down and I was like, okay, I got this. And I, I still had a higher power, but with food, my, I got this is in, gets me in serious trouble. Um, I have never left OA since October of 2020, but I um, have reset my, my abstinent date three different times. Um, the first time I just was, I had an item put on my plate and it was the milk, the, 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 the gym story of whiskey in the milk where it was in front of me. And I thought, you know, it's not going to hurt if I put this sauce with the thing it came with. I had asked my husband not to put it on plate and he brought the food outside and it was on the plate. And I'm like, well, you know, it goes with this item, so it'll be all right. And pretty soon I was like, well, I might as well finish it, even though it didn't go with anything else on my plate. And I, at the end of that meal, I knew I had eaten something I shouldn't have because I had one of my alcoholic uh, food ingredients in it. And I like, I've got to reset my abstinent date. And it took a few days, you know, humility. And I called my sponsor. And what she said was, you know, how would you feel if you, you set your abstinent date in a week or, or don't? And at the end of the week, I'm like, I, I need, I just need, I feel, I feel like an imposter if I don't uh, on meetings. And so I did, and that was fine. I had about six or eight weeks of sobriety at the time of abstinence rather. And, um, and then I was abstinent for almost two years And last November. I was, um, I'll just set you up for what it looks like to relapse. Well, not making as many phone calls, not going. I, I was praying in the morning. I discovered two-way prayer, which is fantastic. I love my two-way prayer. Um, and I'd be glad to answer questions about that later. The um, So my spiritual program was okay, but my fellowship was not happening. I was not sharing at meetings. In fact, I really wasn't going to meetings at this trip I took. And I started having feelings of inadequacy and an imposter where I was going, which was ridiculous. So in other words, um, I was in fear and it was false evidence appearing real, like absolutely. I was thinking everybody hates me. I don't belong here. And so all these feelings came up. Was I practicing a 10 step? No. Was I calling people? No. And at the airport, I picked up a, a, a kind bar. It was like a thing, you know, oh, well, this will be fine because it's healthy. And, um, you know, pretty soon after that, I, I overate, um, when I shouldn't have. So there I go again. Um, I didn't binge long time or anything, but I knew that I have to do this program consistently and constantly. Um, it wasn't until this last time I picked up and, and then that's when I really realized that, um, well, let's just put it this way. I really relapsed. And it started 
as a spiritual relapse. And then it went into an emotional relapse and then a mental relapse. And then I picked up and really binged. And I just want to walk through that real, real quick because there's so many things I wasn't doing and the stages were so evident. First, my, my, um, my sponsor had a stroke in July and she wasn't as available as she had been. And so I, I, I took it like, oh, it's okay. I mean, you, you need to take care of yourself. So, you know, call me when you're ready. Um, so of course she couldn't call because she had, she was ill. And um, I would call her, we'd have mid conversation. She'd say, you know, I'm not, I'm not well right now, I have to go. So I didn't have the support. And what I should have done is get another sponsor. But I didn't because I, t well, because, you know, I have all these excuses and I went on a trip and now I'm on a trip and I'm two and a half weeks on a trip with family and friends and we're all staying at a house. And then we went on a cruise and I was around alcohol and food the entire time. Did I go to meetings? No. Was I calling people? No. Was I in prayer? Yeah, I kind of skipped it a few days. Um, got to this cruise and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to go to the meetings because apparently they were supposed to have one every morning at 10 o'clock. Well, guess what? No one showed up. Every day I went, no one showed up. So now I'm depending on everything else and nothing else is going my way and no one else is going where I want them to go. And pretty soon I'm in an emotional relapse. Nobody's listening to me, poor me. I'm anxious, I'm discontent, I'm irritable. And um, I just wanna fast forward through this because the, sobriety, the abstinence I have today is an absolute miracle. I went into mental relapse when I got home. I, my dog died. It was horrible. 16 years old. I just still so sad about it, but you know, didn't have a chance to grieve it because I just need to move on. Went to work back to work, went on a trip, buried or not buried my dad, but spread his ashes, went on another trip. Like this was just, just way crazy. And I was emotional wreck. And by the time I got home back from this other trip, I was mentally not well. So I'd gone into full on mental relapse and I was on the phone because I thought, well, I just need to call somebody and see how they're doing. Cause when in doubt, reach out. Right. But I didn't call a recovered person. I didn't get a new sponsor. I called someone that was brand new. In fact, she was not in writing. She was in relapse. And I just sat there on the phone thinking I'm so much better than this person. And this person got to eat. So, you know, she's miserable. Eight. I might as well eat. And I got up and I binged after talking to someone in relapse in this program. And I just got off a meeting this morning and someone had asked right before I left the meeting at the, the after session that she'd said something about how she was on the phone with somebody in an outreach call and like went out and bought her food and like started binging while she was on the phone. And I'm like, I get that. I really do understand that. And I just needed to be fully, fully understanding how how much I need this program every single day. So when I talk about this program, um, well, I, so anyway, I got a new sponsor finally. Um, and I worked with someone who was like really, really, really hardcore for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, I just need to speed it up here because it was like, I was on step one for like three weeks and, um, she was great. There was a lot of detail about the food and I just needed to work on my, my program. There was too much detail about the food. So I switched sponsors and I got a new sponsor, but I really worked the first three steps. And why, what I mean by work the first three steps is I read the big book on like through and through with her by myself, taking notes, listen to podcasts about the big book on the first step, on the second step, on the third step, listen to podcasts from the 12 and 12 on the first. Step. I mean, like I was just in it. And um, the other thing, this, this first sponsor that I ended up changing to a different one, required was 30 minutes of prayer and meditation prior to starting my day. I had never done that before. In almost 33 years in AA and three years in OA, I had never done 30 minutes in the morning of prayer and meditation. And so I was like, well, I got, I got it. If that's what they do. So I had all the excuses. Like I get up early enough. Like I can't, I need sleep. So I did. And it wasn't like two days in, I started noticing a difference. And by like two weeks in, I was doing this meditation. Someone turned me on to actually someone in this meeting, I think, uh, told me about um, Insight Timer app. And it's like, I just put in recovery and there's all these meditations. So I listen every single morning to 
on awakening 11th step. And it's a reading of the 11th step and it's a reading of, um, and then she turns it into a prayer and it's a meditation and I need that guided meditation. So I do that and I do a, a couple of others. Um, I've got my favorites, but I, I discover new ones and it has absolutely changed my life. So the practice of on awakening, I think about my day and before I even think about it, I ask God to change my thinking and divorce it from self-pity, dishonest, self-seeking motives. And I quickly pause the thing and I look at my calendar and I look at it and I'm like, oh, okay, those are the things I have. They're yours now, God. And then I go back to my meditation and I do the full meditation. And when I'm done with it, I pick up my notebook and I do to a prayer. In other words, I actually pray to God, this is what I have today. How would you have me do this? How would you have me be today? And then I listen and then I, I just write what I feel like it's not even a feeling. It's just kind of what comes back to me. And a lot of times it's, <laughs> it's not even anything I would ever imagine coming. And I get, um, I get affirmation that I'm not alone. I get affirmation that I am loved by my higher power. I get direction from my higher power. And oftentimes it's things that I would probably have come to if I thought about it without a bunch of other negative self-talk. But sometimes it's things that I never would have thought of. But always it feels very, very right and very, very um, giving and selfless. I feel grateful. And being of service is not a duty. Being of service is what I want to do. That is not this alcoholic, compulsive overeater, self-centered to the core person that I woke up as before I did this. And so when I start my day that way, um, it like it's changed my life, you know? I did, I had to go through all the steps again. And when I got the step, the, the, the sponsor that I have now, I said, so can we start off step four? Cause I was like ready to start, start into step four. Sorry, I'm bouncing out around a little bit, but she said, yeah, I want you to, let's just do steps for one, two and three because she had a way of doing it. And, and the way she guided me to do it was um, they were by chapter. And this um, is, she wanted me to listen to chapter one, or doctor's opinion, and then chapter one. And they were all, it happened to be Harlan G speaking. And I'm like, great, I've heard Harlan G speak. He's awesome. And, uh, but these like every single chapter, it was Harlan G. And then we had a couple other in, a couple of other ones in there and she had a few assignments in there. But I, I faithfully listened to each one of those, did my um, notes, did my uh, assignments as she said, and I, uh, she didn't even require me to send in my food, but I know that if I don't send in my food and it's not like four ounces of carrot, you know, it, it's literally like, you know, two cups of vegetables. Um, and I don't, I don't want to talk about food that much, but it's like, I have my food plan that came from my, my nutritionist, you know, she's like, whatever your nutritionist wants you to eat, that's that. And, um, just to be clear too, I have weighed the same give or take one or two pounds since I came into OA three years ago. And that is a freaking miracle because I was a yo-yo dieter and it was like up 10, down eight, up five, down two, up, you know, and, and in my, you know, when I turned 50, I was like, it never went down. <laughs> I just, I couldn't bring it down. And so I was up, 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 up slowly. But um, I've been, and I fit into the same clothes I fit in for three years. It's an absolute miracle. I don't have like three different, actually I have like, four different sizes in my closet before. And um, so, sorry, back to, so the steps I did the step, I did my fourth step in a day, fifth step in a day with the sixth step, seventh step. And then the next day I did my eighth step and my ninth step that night. I only had one. Then I realized in my 10th step, uh, I completely forgot someone that I had needed to owe an amends to. So I did a four step back with her as well. Um, talked to my sponsor about it and uh, reached out to do a nine step with her. And it's, it's been, you know, it was really quick because I've done this a lot of times and I don't have a lot of resentments. Um, how much more time do I have, by the way? Coming up to five minutes on about five minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just want to um, just focus in on the the 10th and really the 10th and 11th step. Um, oh, and I'm back to sponsoring my, my old sponsee, which is fantastic because we continued during my whole process, even when I relapsed, I told her I relapsed. I continued to, um, we read through the 12 and 12 
we, we've read through the big book together and then we were just reading through the 12 and 12 and we were on step 10. And so we're now we're through step um, 11 and it's just awesome because now we're going to step 12 and it's exactly where I'm at right now back in my recovered state. So, uh, and I say recovered because I'm recovered from hopelessness and, and a hopeless state of mind and a hopeless state of body. And um, I don't necessarily wake up that way at the crack of dawn, but I'm there once I do this recovery step, the 10th and the 11th. Um, there's some things in the 12 and 12. I know we really focus on the big book in this meeting, which of course that's where my recovery comes to as well, but there's some little things that Bill Wilson about, uh, um, sorry, um, um, what's the word that he, anyway, that he talks about more in the 12 and 12. And the, in the beginning it asks, can I keep an emotional balance and can I live to good purpose in all conditions? And so I ask myself, am I in emotional balance? It's a really great spot check inventory. And in the in the um, 10th step in the 12 and 12, it talks about different kinds of inventories. There's the spot check inventory, which is kind of any time of day, all day. And it's what we call it the 10th step. You know, it's like, I'm irritated. I'm doubtful. I'm in fear. What is this? What's going on? And I can look, okay, this is a fear or this is, you know, I'm pissed off at somebody. Somebody did something I don't like. Basically, like Harlan says, you didn't follow the script I had for you. I totally get that line of thinking. You know, I have a script. You're supposed to follow it. These things are supposed to happen. And they don't. And and I, I love it now because I can get to chuckle, go, oh, that was me and my plan. And that wasn't God's. So I'm, I, I like to follow God's script, except that he only gives me my part when it's my time to talk. And he doesn't give it to me ahead of time. Um, so I have to trust God. But that's that spot check inventory any time of day when I'm agitated or doubtful. And then there's the, at the day's end, you know, a review and a review of my day. And, and it's not all horrible, you know? I mean, I really do, I can, I can note where, ah, oh, that was really, I'm glad I did that for my son today. Oh, I took that phone call when I didn't want to, because I do need to see where and affirm where what worked, worked, you know? Well, that's why I was so at peace the rest of the day, because I did my, my inventory uh, this morning at nine o'clock when I was already ticked off about something. <laughs> and I did a 10 step and I called someone, you know, that, that was great that I called three people today because man, I stayed really sane today at work or whatever it is. And then there's, um, but I definitely also review and was I selfish? Was I self-centered? Did I bring in bitterness or, or jealousy? Did I say something that might've aroused jealousy or, or bitterness or um, make someone upset? So I look at that. And for the most part, I get to say, no, I didn't. And that's awesome. Um, and then there's a full fourth step inventory that a lot of us do, you know, maybe every six months or once a year. I think it's like, I know in my, my past experience, I, I do a full four step once a year, roughly, and uh, maybe every two years, but once a year. And, and I have to do that because I don't even realize that there might be resentments that build up. I'm, I might not even realize it. And the coolest thing about this program is that it's through a resentment, the four through and through the ninth step, which we shorten in the 10th step, but it's, it's through that way of, of focusing down that we get to what we can change in ourselves. Because I know that if anything is wrong and it says it in the 12 and 12 and, and of course in the big book as well, anytime there's something wrong with me, it's there's something wrong in the world, something wrong in my life, it, there's something wrong with me. And sure, other people cross me, other people do things that are wrong, absolutely. But does it matter? Because if I start fighting it, I have to fight. I have to stop fighting everything, everyone. I have to stop that fight and let God do all my battles. You know, there's spiritual battles. God fights them. But what I can do is I can take my, my selfishness, my dishonesty, my fears, acknowledge who I far, a harm and ask God how to make restitution. I can take all those things and say, God, I want to be the opposite. What should I do instead? Um, and I do that in two-way prayer, and I do that with someone on the phone doing a 10th step, and, uh, and I pray, God, thank you so much for taking away my fear, and I turn to gratitude, and I turn to someone I can help. So I think that's probably my time. Um, for I, done about. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for listening. I hope somebody got something out of it. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Annabelle. Beautiful share. Thank you so much. Um, and now we have Craig F all the way from Oklahoma and love getting to see him and uh, hear him share a lot on Scottsdale. So go right ahead, Craig. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Annabelle, for your for your uh, story. It was great. Uh, enjoyed hearing it. I want to start and just say a quick prayer and ask God to help me, uh, guide me, help me hear from the heart, Lord, today, and help me say the things you'd have me say and get my ego out of the way. Uh, amen. Um, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And uh, I want to talk about that in a little bit, uh, especially that word thoroughly followed our path. There are those who uh, do not recover, uh, people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are unconstitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They're not at fault. They uh, seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of being honest, uh, rigorously honest. Their chances are less than average. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's here if we get, we're willing to go to any length to get it. Uh, I would have told you I was willing to go to any length to get it uh, at, at any time in my life, but I didn't understand what willing to go to any lengths meant. Uh, you know, my, my story, uh, my, my, my whole story uh, is a story of fighting this spiritual malady from a very young age. And I fought it. Um, I, I, I fought it by um balancing it <laughs> i thought you know i i i usually don't tell i tell my food story when i'm in an oa meeting and i tell my alcohol story when i'm in an aa meeting and i tell the rest of the story when i'm in a bar room i suppose but the fact of the matter is that um you know i i, I fought food with alcohol and i fought alcohol with food and i fought both of them with uh, inappropriate relationships and, and other behaviors. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did that from a very young age. Um, my, uh, uh, you know, my first drunk was at 14, uh, my first real drunk, but I'd been drinking some uh, in junior high, you know, uh, I did, but, um, you know, I, I was, um, I'm, I, I was born a compulsive overeater and I think I was also born an alcoholic and, uh, uh both of them manifested early and I thought it was, um, I thought it was based in a lot of other things. You know, my parents were children of the depression. You know, I was I'm a child of the sixties. I graduated high school in 69. Yes. I'm an old man. Um, so, uh, I, I, uh, uh grew up with this, with these, parents especially a mother who had grown up destitute in the depression she was from a family of 16 kids and they went without food and so our dinner time was was stories of her nearly starving to death sometimes as a child going for days without food but and then she would portion out our food and tell us uh, to, you know that this that we had to be grateful that we had what we had to eat and uh, I, for a long time, blamed my compulsive eating on that. I don't anymore. I, I don't, I, I, I think there may be some behavior problems associated with that. But, um, you know, I think my compulsive overeating is more just in my nature. Um, I, her father was also an alcoholic and, uh, my, and my mother was uh, a perfect codependent in, in, in many ways. And, uh, uh, a codependent enabler um so uh, anyway i i uh i went I, i'm six foot four uh, i used to be i'm i shrunk a little in my old age i uh, uh was athletic uh i loved basketball i loved hunting i loved fishing i i, I played football and baseball I, I i loved them but i didn't love them as much as i did basketball and uh my eating and my even my drinking didn't show up as as problems physically for a long time because of my activity. Um, I I in Kansas I grew up in Kansas in a small town. You could get a driver's license and a learner's permit at fourteen, and and I had already been working uh, uh, 
detasseling seed corn and bucking hay bales all summer long for people and was able to buy a car. I had a car when I, by, before I turned 14, I already owned a car before I could drive. And uh, uh, so I had a car going through all through high school. Uh, at 16, the restrictions came off the license and I could go anywhere I wanted day or night. Um, uh, before I was restricted to to and from school, to and from church, agricultural errands. So I always raised chickens and I carried chicken feed in the trunk. So I was always on an agricultural errand. But um, we, uh, uh, but when I turned 16 and was able to go anywhere I wanted and I had money in my pocket because I always worked, I, I uh, always had money in my pocket. I uh, was able to get whatever I wanted. From my junior year of high school, I reported for football at 240 pounds, six foot four. And the coach said, that's too heavy. You need to take off 20 pounds before basketball season. And I went on my first diet and uh, it came off so easy and so quick. And I didn't stop drinking and I didn't realize how many calories that the beer and the whiskey had in it. And, uh, but you know, my mother helped me plan my food and I, I, uh, I took that 20 pounds off quickly and easily and thought this is easy with nothing to worry about here. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could go back and tell that 14 year old, a 16 year old boy, uh, be a little careful about this, but, uh, I, I, I couldn't, I can't. So anyway, I was able to maintain that weight down at two, at two twenty until I graduated high school. I, I had an opportunity to play small college basketball, but my ego was so big that, uh, the, the big colleges said, uh, KU, my, I'm a KU, KU <laughs> guy, my KU said, uh, you're too short to play forward and too slow to play guard. Uh, we'll give you a make good scholarship, but, uh, or make good. If you can make the team your freshman year, we'll pay you, but I couldn't afford to do that. So my ego and my drinking got in my way and I didn't, I didn't end up playing college basketball. I got married. I got a girl pregnant right out of high school, my, my girlfriend pregnant. Um, uh, she was uh, two years younger than me. Uh, we got married. I was 19. She was 17. Um, had a son right at my uh, 20th birthday. And it's my first child. And I thought I had to clean life up, you know, and I was already fighting this stuff. I was already fighting it. I, I had, uh, uh, like I said, I used alcohol to fight the food and food to fight the alcohol. And I, I, my, if I had a motto, it was, I'm going to swallow life whole. You know, I, I, I just had that, per, that type A personality that said, uh, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm attacking life and I'm going to, I'm going to win and I'm going to win at everything I do. And uh, I'm going to attack life and, and I'm not going to let anything slow me down. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, admitting powerlessness over anything was would have not been in my nature. I'll assure you that. Um, you know, I saw life as a series of gains. You gained a marriage, you gained children, you gained a college degree, you gained a business, you gained money, and you just kept on gaining until you, until the end. And I never saw it. Somebody explained to me once that life was a series of necessary losses, and. Uh, and, and, and that just kind of pissed me off on the inside because I didn't want to see that life is a series of necessary losses. And it is, um, you know, I, I, I made and lost a, a million dollars twice in my life. Uh, I, I, you know, built businesses and, and burned them to the ground, I burned a marriage and a several relationships to the ground. I, I used to, uh, I used to rope with a, I, I got a little cowboy in my background. I used to rope with a guy, an old cowboy that said every man in his life is entitled to one good horse, one good dog, and a lot of no good women. And uh, I, I've had my one good horse, and I've had several good dogs. I got a couple now. Um, and I've had a lot of women that were probably a lot better than I gave them credit for, but I didn't give them a chance, you know. Um, uh, I, I uh, when when I was getting divorced, I said to my friend, I said, I don't know what happened, what happened to her. I'd been married 20 years. 
I said, I don't know what happened to her. She wasn't like that when I married her. And my friend said, well, she was being married to your sorry ass for 20 years that made her that way. And I thought, I said, it wasn't my fault. I was never home that much. Uh, I was out attacking the world. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I realize how stupid that is now, but it seemed to make sense at the time. Um, that that 20 years that I was married is a series of, of, of um uh, diets and a series of paying ways and a series of, of attempts to control this to control the food and the weight but never understanding that behind it all was a spiritual malady you know um i i, I believed in god i believed in i've always believed in god from the time i was a child i've never doubted the existence of god and never doubted that he was there in my life but that's part of that that duality you know that living with a foot in two worlds uh, i could believe there was a god and still have a and still have a wife and girlfriends you know I, I could believe there's a god and still do things that have violated my own moral code because i have a spiritual malady you know i have a me disease that says whatever it takes to make me feel good today is okay uh, you know whether it's uh, too much food or too much alcohol it's whatever makes i need to make me feel good today I managed to get a, a, a degree. Uh, it's a five-year degree. Uh, it's a architectural engineering, bachelor of science. It's a degree that uh, it's all the hours for for a, a bachelor of architecture and all the hours for a structural engineering degree. And uh, I uh, have used that. You know, I'm still using that degree. I still I. Um, I, I uh, am an estimator, project manager for construction companies. I built projects large and small all over the country. And it's given me a chance to live all over the country and see a lot of things and, and be a lot of places. Um, and that part of my life's been good. But, uh, you know, uh, it, I've still not maximized uh, the my... I've not taken maximum advantage of my talents because I have this smirch, this spiritual malady because I've let my my ego get in the way. I've let my uh, I've let my disease, my my shortcomings, get in the way. I couldn't see them. I couldn't inventory them. I couldn't uh, uncover them because the, my ego made me blind to my side of things. You know. Um, and so um, I, I went through that 20 years of being or so of being married, uh, which brought me up to about 40. And, and in that time, my yo-yo dieted and my way up to, to 410 pounds. Now, you know, I lifted weights most of the time. And, uh, you know, at 300 pounds, I could still dunk a basketball. And at 400 pounds, I couldn't. But, um, uh, I, I, I would tell myself that I carried 400 pounds pretty good. <laughs> what you can make of that, whatever you want, uh, you know, ego or not, but, um, you know, I, I certainly didn't want to be that heavy and I fought it and I fought it, but, uh, the marriage fell apart and, you know, I, I blamed her for a long time because that was the easy thing to do. Um, you know? Uh, but uh, when we get to the fourth step, one of the things we learn is, I think we learn, is that that fourth column is the most important column because it's the one thing that leads to change. What was my part? What what could I have done different? What did I do to set things in motion? And, uh, you know, I, I get to inventory, I got to inventory that and see that I had a part, that I set things in motion, that, that I had more than a part in that that it that uh, it was and that that's the only thing i can change if there's going to be change i can't expect anybody else to change i have to change me but uh, towards the end of that marriage um i went to we were living in arizona at the time and uh, uh, i was actually working in allentown pennsylvania and uh, flying back and forth and uh, uh, see my ego and say, well, I'm so valuable. They had to fly me back and forth. <laughs> and, uh, um, the truth is um, that uh, I was handling a, a 
a pretty big lawsuit. And uh, so I uh, uh, was back there and she said she was unhappy and thinking about a divorce. And uh, we'd had um, some frank discussions. Uh, in order to get a divorce in Arizona, you have to get, at the time, if you had minor children, you had to get counseling. So we went to separately to a counselor, to a counseling group. And uh, I, I got lucky. Uh, I, I walked, the counselor that I got was 20 years sober in AA. And he talked to me for an hour and he said, uh, at the end of that hour, he, he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go to Overeaters Anonymous and I want you to go for a year. And at the end of that year, if you're ready to be honest with me, I want you to come back and see me and maybe we can do some good. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I was a bar fighter, you know, I've been, I've never walked away from a fight in my life. Uh, and I wanted to pop him in the nose. I mean, I just was so close to popping him for telling me that I, but he was true. It was on. And the reason that irritated me so much was he was right. I, I was not being honest with him. I, I, I had a mask up. I was trying to show him a face that was different than, than who I was, you know? Um, and, uh, and he was right. Uh, counseling wouldn't do me any good. None of that would do me any good because I have the capacity to be honest, but I wouldn't be an honest, you know, and you can't recover, you know, it, 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 without rigorous honesty. You know, we talk about rigorously abstinent, but we ought to talk more about rigorously honest. You know, I have to be rigorously honest today in all things. And, uh, so I, I, uh, I made a few phone calls and found it away in Allentown. I flew back. That was uh, flew back there and uh, uh, where I was working. And I found and I thought the woman that answered the phone was kind of funny. I thought and she was giving me this list of meetings and I thought I had to pick one. And uh, she was trying to tell me to go to a meeting that night. And I said no, that one on Monday night's real close to my. Uh, hotel that I'm staying at I think I'll just go to that one and she said well how about tonight and I'm going well I you know I thought I had to pick one well, you know you're gonna go to one a week so I uh I, I went to the one on Monday night and uh, they had a speaker and and the woman I just didn't didn't get to me I I thought this is crazy this is maybe some kind of cult that they sent me to I don't know uh, they haven't asked me for any money yet, but I think they're about to. But uh, so I listened to her and I and uh, she talked. She was celebrating a one year birthday and she was talking about wanting to bring in a brass band. And and I thought, yeah, you're you got a, you got an ego <laughs> spot it. You got it right. But um, anyway, uh, I. Uh, um, I left there and unsure about what I was going to do. And I had to go back to Arizona uh, right away because we had a deposition we had to take and it was, it, it was critical. And so I flew back and uh, spent the weekend and, and a tense weekend with the wife and the kids. And, and um, she, one of the things I'd done when she'd started telling me she was unhappy was I had bought her a new car. I thought that might make her happy. I was going to build her a house and buy her a car. I thought that would calm her down. And uh, she, I bought her 300ZX Nissan. That's what she wanted. And uh, she took me to the airport, and I, I could barely get in and out of that little car. But So she drove up, and uh, oddly enough, it was it's probably – you know, uh, 200 yards from where, where Harlan fell uh, the other day at Sky Harbor Airport. But I, uh, uh, I, she pulled up to the gate and uh, pulled up to the door and I got out of the car with my carry-on bag and, and uh, she handed me a letter out the window of the car and hit the gas, about tore my hand off because the letter said she made up her mind she wanted a divorce, but she went on to take my inventory with that letter, you know, 
to tell me everything that uh, she didn't like about being married to me. And I, I don't have, I don't know if I saw that letter or not, but the fact is it was probably true. And those days, those traveling days like that were always days that uh, I, you know, I didn't have any, I didn't, I wasn't in an office, I didn't anything to do. So I would, you know, eat in the airport at Sky Harbor. I'd get some drinks. I'd have a drink on the airplane. I, you know, usually I change planes in, in, in Chicago or Atlanta, you know, depending on which way I was going. And, and then have a, and I, and there'd be a little layover. So I'd have a few drinks there and, and maybe eat another meal. And then I'd have a flight to Newark because usually what I did was flew in and out of Newark and I'd have a few drinks on the airplane going, maybe eat the meal if they were serving it, land in Newark, have a few more drinks catch the shuttle. And by the time I got back to the hotel in uh, Allentown, I'd be, uh, uh, they'd, you know, uh, I'd, I'd hope the shuttle would take me up to my, <laughs> up to my room. Cause I couldn't walk very far by then. Uh, I was, you know, tell you that I'd been eating and drinking all day long. And, uh, that day, that day I, I didn't, that day I sat there on that airplane, you know, and read that letter over and over again. And realized that I was spiritually, morally, financially uh, uh, bankrupt. That I, I I was bankrupt in every way somebody could be bankrupt. Um, she admitted in that letter that she had uh, ran up a whole lot of credit card debt. You know, we get those credit card applications in the mail. And she'd gotten every one of them she could get and maxed every one of them out. And I got stuck in the divorce of about... I got out of some of it, but I just got stuck with it. Uh, about a hundred thousand dollars in unsecured credit card debt, and uh, you know that was one of the things I had trouble forgiving her for. But uh, I, I, you know, I realized that it was her acting out. It was her disease, and uh, you know, it was in reaction to some of the things that you know my vacancy, my emotional vacancy, my not being there and being part of that marriage for a long time. So. I, I sat on that airplane and I, I came to that realization and it was a Monday and I got back to Allentown and I went to a meeting that night, that same meeting. And this time there was another speaker and this time I heard what the speaker had to say. And, and this speaker talked about how she had the hole in her soul. You know, it was the first time I'd ever heard that. And she talked about how she tried to fill that hole in her soul with Diet Coke. God, how many Diet Cokes I used to drink. How, how she tried to fill that hole with uh, with men, how she had to try to hold it, fill that hole with with sex, with relationships, with alcohol, with food, with drugs. How she tried to fill that hole with everything she could think of, and nothing filled that hole because it was a god sized hole until she got to program. And I realized that I had a hole in my soul, that I had this spiritual same spiritual malady. And, and that I'd done pretty much the same thing from a different angle at times, but the same thing. And, and when she was done, I, I, you know, I have a John Wayne concept in myself and I probably have cried three times in my life, maybe four. And, and that was one of them, you know, and I sat there and I realized that, it, that it was me, you know, that, that my, trying to eat life whole thing had not worked that I had tried to be in large and in charge and it made me large and not in charge. And, uh, I sat there as a 410 pounds and, uh, in a shipwreck. I got a sponsor that night, a good guy. Uh, he started to take, we, we sat down, we, we outlined my, the foods that I couldn't eat, uh, the foods I shouldn't eat. He, uh, he, he told me to take alcohol out of my food plan because of the calories. Uh, we still didn't address the alcoholism. We just took it out of the cow out of that. Uh, I wasn't ready to admit that anyway, but we, uh, uh, we, we did that and, uh, we, uh, started to work the steps, uh, started to kind of work them with the big book. And, uh, uh, I did the first three steps with him over the next couple of months and, because now I have a lot of time on my hands. Um, I'm going to the gym every day. I'm doing an AA meeting at lunch. I'm doing an OA meeting in the evening. And, the, and uh, there's a, we 
the company belongs to a 24 hour tennis club and gym. And I'm going over there after the meeting in the evening and working out, lifting weights. Five and minutes, I lost Craig. weight. Uh, thank you. I lost weight rapidly. I got down I, uh, in the first 10 months, I dropped 140, 150 pounds. I got down to 260, um, got down pretty close to, you know, getting close to my playing weight. My ego got bigger than, than my belt size though, because I was doing it. I thought, you know, I still hadn't got a hold of the I'm powerless concept. I still hadn't gotten a hold. You know, I'd gotten a hold of the fact that I had a spiritual malady, but I hadn't gotten a hold of the idea that 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 the solution to that spiritual malady was this spiritual awakening. I'd read I'd read there's a solution over and over again. And uh, I wanted that, you know, I, I, I could see the solution was in there, but I couldn't quite see how to get there. And I kept thinking if God would only just, you know, hit me with that white light experience like he did Bill. Then, then everything else would work out, you know. But what I missed was the line in the twelfth step. You know, I hadn't really understood that it says, "Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps." That three little word, three letter little word there, the, the most important letter, most important word in the in the twelve steps, the, the result. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps is the result. Um, you know, I, uh, I, our, our friend Kim in, in New Jersey says, I'm sorry you didn't get the results from the work you didn't do. You know, well, I didn't do the work, so I didn't get the results. I hadn't thoroughly given myself to this program. You know, I, I went into, uh, I, uh, but, you know, I had that enough physical recovery that now, now I'm single. And now I'm down to playing weight, and now I'm in an environment uh, of uh, uh, of twelve step meetings where there's a lot of women that needed my attention, and uh, I was more than willing to give that, you know. And, and I, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that because uh, you know I, I'm still using something other than my relationship with God to keep me sober. You know, I'm still using some uh, alcohol, food relationships. I'm still using something to fill that God hole. You know, I'm trying to use God, but I don't know how, you know. And uh, I got into a relationship. I, I, I ended up moving after a year. I got here. I didn't pick up my two-year chip. I got in a relationship with a woman. Um, she has, we had a child together. Uh, I thought it was the love of my life. I wasn't ready to handle that. Um, uh, you know, woman I met in program, uh, still one of my best friends, didn't work out. Um, I crashed and burned. Um, I, I, w when the relationship ended, particularly, I crashed and burned. Uh, I, I, uh, I ended up gaining... Uh, yo-yoing my way up to 520 pounds in relapse never quit working um but at 520 pounds i was uh i got up one morning i had lymphedema in my legs i got up one morning to go to work and i didn't have the strength to stand up i, I couldn't get out of, i had a dressing chair an easy chair in my room and i i'd sat down in a chair and i didn't have the strength to stand up and I'm too hard headed to have called anybody for help. I had my cell phone in my hand, but I didn't call. I didn't call. And I spent several hours trying to stand up thinking if I could just get this angle or get my legs under me that way I could stand. And then I thought if I can get down on the floor, I crawl over to the bed and I'll pull myself up on the bed and then I can stand up from there. And I got down on the floor and I couldn't get up on the bed. And, 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 so I finally dialed, I called my son, the son I had with this, with the, you know, 20 years earlier with or 25 years earlier with the woman I met in program, the woman that I broke up with. And I called her that broke up with me. And I, I called the son who'd now, he'd played college football and he's big, six, six, five and a half and 
played offensive line at 300 pounds, solid muscle. And I called him and I said, can you come by and help me? I, I'm down on the floor and I can't get up. And so he said, I'll be there in a minute. But he called his mom. and His mom called me and said, listen, if you're too weak to stand up, I'm, you're going to the hospital. And I said, That's uh, time, uh, can I have a few more minutes? I want to get off the floor here. And, and I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to, I'll call the hospital, I'll call the ambulance. And I called an ambulance and six big firemen came and they rolled me on a tarp and they picked the tarp up and put me in the hospital and took me to the hospital. And at the hospital, the doctor said, you have a septic infection in that lymphedema in your legs. And, and we're going to keep you three weeks on an IV antibiotic. And my ego said out loud, I'm too important at work. I can't stay here for three weeks. Can you, uh, can you just put a pick line in and give me the antibiotics and I'll put them in my change the bag four times a day. And the doctor says, you don't understand. She said, if you don't do this just right, you got a 25% chance of dying in the next three weeks. And even if you do do it right, you've got a 40% chance of the infection coming back and we'll have to take your legs off at the knees. And she said, so if I were you, I'd quit worrying about whether they need you at work or not and lay back in that bed and let us take care of you and save your legs and your life. And I laid down in that bed that night and it's another time that I cried. And I cried out and I said, God, I'm all in, uh, whatever it takes, whatever I have to do, whatever I have to confess to, whatever I have to uh, make amends for, whatever it is that I've been, all those things I've been holding back on, uh, I'm ready. I'm in, I'm yours, you know, um, help me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond my own ability to help myself. And my friend, the this mother of my youngest child uh, came the next morning and and I told her I, what I what had happened and she said here's the number for vision for you and here's a number of a guy that might sponsor you and his name's Harlan G and why don't you call him and that was seven years ago this October is seven years ago the twelfth of October and uh, I called him we started working the steps. And then the three weeks I was in the hospital, I was making amends when I left the hospital. And I haven't had, I haven't eaten compulsively again yet ever. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it's, it's been a rough journey. I, I've had a minor heart attack, a pacemaker, intestinal surgery. I, I, I've had a litany of problems over these last uh, seven years, but I wouldn't trade them for anything. I, uh, uh, and I've lost 150 pounds and the weight's coming off slowly, but it's coming off. But more important, I've had a spiritual experience and it's filled that spiritual hole. And uh, today I, 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 uh, I have a life that's beyond my wildest expectations, even though there are things that I would do better, uh, di different, I still wouldn't change a thing. And with that, I'll pass. Thank you. Thanks for letting me have a little extra time. Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much. And thank you, Annabelle. Beautiful shares. And um, we are at the close of our meeting.